joining us from Far Rockaway is Rebetzin Shirley Pelkowitz. She's the Rebetzin of, uh, of the, formerly of the Weichel. Uh, uh, her husband was Rabbi Ralph Pelkowitz, very famous, a leading voice in the development of NCSY. Rebetzin Pelkowitz was a 1948 graduate of Beis Yaakov, founder of the Hebrew Academy of Miami Beach, a famous machana. Her daughter, Mrs. Kanner, principal of the Katz Yeshiva High School in Boca. She speaks internationally. One of the erudite women of Kal Yisrael. It's an honor to have you both welcome. So Rebetzin Pelkowitz, how important is it and was it for you that your daughter follow in your footsteps? It was a, um, our lifestyle was such that it didn't surprise me that my daughter would be go, go into education. She is an extremely talented, talented young woman. She is a brilliant student. She was the star student at Stern College. She always fascinated audiences with her ability to speak. Her scholarship is unbelievable. And we just knew that this was where she was going to go. She, it was in the genes. Her father, Zechron of Racha, Rabbi Alexander Gross, was a machanech par excellence. I was in Chinuch. It was a house of Chinuch. Our children all grew up in a home of Chinuch. And to have a gifted child who wanted to go into the same field was really a bracha. It was okay. really... So, so Mrs. Kanner, did, did you feel a pressure? Like a lot of children sort of have a sense they want to go their own way. And, you know, uh, I personally married the daughter of, uh, of a Rosh Hashiva, and they struggle with, they always have to act in a certain way. The community expects it. And in many kids, it brings out a sort of like a, a need for autonomy. How did you balance your need for autonomy with the expectation of your parents that you would go into henna? Um, firstly, I will say that one of the greatest attributes of my parents raising us was that they always included us and made us feel like we were participants in their mission of spreading Torah, of inspiring others. And my parents always insisted upon menschlichkeit that we, we understood even at a young age without being told that we had to, but we were inspired by their lifestyles, their Ahavas Yisrael, to want to live our lives and be models as well of what it means to be a Torah Jew in the city of Miami Beach, which when I grew up was the city of the three S's, Sin, Sun, and Sand. Obviously, in choosing a career of Chinuch, if I had any thoughts of filling my parents' shoes, I would have never chosen to be a life of chinuch. I never asked myself, because such an aspiration would have been paralyzing for me and my brothers and sister. But though I could never reach their level of chinuch, of avas Yisrael, of avas Torah, of total and complete dedication of every aspect of their lives, I was zocha to be touched by them. And I grew up in their home with a front row seat imbibing their teachings. I forever have etched in my mind their model of what it is to be a machanech and of Avas Yisrael and of treating every child and raising him al pidarko. And that to this day helps guide and inform every decision that I make. Um, I, I can only say that I feel fortunate beyond words to have had those rich life altering experience and to have been zocha to experience those giant role models in my life. Um, I think above all that the voice that I hear reverberating in my head most often is that of my parents' admonition to look past the externals, to pierce through the outer inessential layers and focus on the neshama of the child of the human being in front of you, the Jew in front of you. So Reb, let me ask Rebbe Tzimpelgos, let me do a follow-up question. We, we all know many mechanchem, many rabbanim, whose kids didn't really buy it and sort of, you know, left, uh, either didn't stay in Chinuch or, or, or more than that. You, on the other hand, have a number of children, including David, who is 
uh, you know, somebody I looked, I, one of the most respected, you know, mechanchem, psychologists in Kval Yisrael, as well as your daughter, I don't know any of your other children, if you were to say, the ones who got it right did X, and the ones who weren't successful with their children did Y, how would you, what would you say? You know, uh, there's no answer to that. Let me tell you something. When the last thing I say in my chakras davening, I end my davening every day with Kapitel Kuf Nun in Tehillim, Kuf Gimel in Tehillim, Borchi Nafshi Es Hashem. And in that capital, I say it because it's really, it covers my life. My, it covers everyone's life story, what the Rabbon Shalom does for our, for, our, for our nefesh. And one of the things it says, <sighs> which means that God embellishes our ornaments. What is a mother's ornament? A mother's ornaments are her children. And when the Rabbon Shalom embellishes those children with chachma, with knowledge, with beauty, with wonderful neshamas, with a dream to carry on our dream. You know what my feeling is? Borchi nafshi es Hashem. This is all men hashamayim. I can't take credit for it. It's true, my children were raised in a home where every child that came through our door was a neshama that we loved. We never saw the bad, we only saw the good. My husband, Zechron of Rachel Alexander Gross, was an unusual neshama. He was an unusual person. Brilliant, smart, but was a neshama that was beyond all. And when he would meet children, and these were children, we came to Miami Beach, as Zora Lee said, it was a, it was a sin and sin and son, that's what it was. It was not, there were no Jewish people, that, there were Jews. But my children didn't have religious friends, from friends. And I remember when we came to Miami, my friends would say to me, you're going there? How are you going to raise your children? And I said, don't worry, my children will be fine. And they went along with us. And they had playmates. They didn't go to their playmates. Their playmates came to them. And they were happy to come because these kids were wonderful kids. They offered their playmates everything. They offered their friends anything they wanted. And they saw in my children a media, a lifestyle that their Yiddish and Hashemis wanted too. They wanted that lifestyle. And that's how we built a school. We built a school. We had over 800 children. And these were not, and when we started, I think if we had 10 from families, it was a lot. And this is how the community came. People came. Oh, we heard there's a school. We heard Rabbi Gross is here. We're coming. We're coming. And they came. And the nice thing is that they didn't look down and say, well, it's not from, it's not yeshiva. They came because they knew they wanted to be part of Klai Yisrael. So the from came and the non-from came and they melded and they, Baruch Hashem. We can say, as hanefesh asher asa. We so, Rebetzin, it sounds to me that if, if you were to pick one point, what's coming across to me is it's love for the children. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is always the neshama, the Yiddish neshama. B'Tselem Elohim bara is hardom. B'Tselem Elohim was always in our mind. And this is what Rabbi Gross, the Krona Lefrocha, taught us all. Every person, every child is at Selim Elohim. And I remember when he would talk to teachers at teachers' meetings. And, you know, kids can be rambunctious, they can be penitzoros. And some of these kids came from homes that I don't want to even tell you about. And he would speak to the teachers. Many of them would have difficult times with kids. They'd want to throw them out. They'd want to do anything to them. And he would always say, remember, that Selim Elohim, or this is it, Selim Elohim. You can bring it out. You will bring out that Selim Elohim. It's there. And that's how we encouraged people. It was hard work. We worked very hard. Our home did you, was... Did you, ever throw a child, did you ever throw a child out of school? Oh, unless a psychiatrist told us the child just can't do it. <laughs> okay. Unless 
very rarely, very rarely. No child was ever refused acceptance. Uh, if they were thrown out, it was only at the advice of professional, of professional. And I'm just curious, what happens a, a, a child who couldn't pay tuition, what did you do? That's where, Rabbi, I have to tell you something that I found out just recently. And uh, my son, Shragi, incidentally, all my children are in Chinuch. Wow. One way, they are, one is a lawyer, but he has a dafyomi. He teaches a dafyomi. One is a psychiatrist, but she has a Nach class in her home every, she has gone through all Nach with a class. She has her own private class of people. My other son, Shragi, is a Mechanic. He was, he's been a Menachal of a Betz in the Yeshiva in Edison, he was. And so every one of them, and my son Carmi, who is in Eretz Yisrael, has started his own Yeshiva. It is a, now at the first Hezda Yeshiva, for Haredim. So my children are all the Chinuch. Chinuch is our love. It's in our genes, I think. So oh, I started to tell you uh, what, I forgot the story I started. About to tuition. Oh, about tuition. So recently my son Shragi went to visit someone in an old age home. And a woman called him, she said, Shragi, is that you? And he said, yes. Yeah. She said, and she was my husband, Rabbi Gross's secretary. Now, this woman is an old lady already, too. Well, we're all old. And she said to him, I have to tell you something because I never told anybody this was a secret between your father and me. What is the secret? She said, Rabbi Gross had a folder in his desk. It wasn't even in his desk. He had it in, in his secretary's desk. He kept the folder. And it was called Meine Kinder. And what was the story with Meine Kinder? These were children who could not pay tuition, and the board would never allow them in. He had these children there, and he would raise money for their tuition. He would go out when he would raise money for other things, he would set aside money for their tuition, and they were called minor kinder. And the tuition would be paid through this in the file. In other words, went to these children in the file. Now, this was a story that his secretary, who had never shared, of course, he told that he made a promise that she would never tell anybody. They would, the board would never find out about it. So this is, this, this is dedication. I don't know if we have that today. So Mrs. Cantor, what do you value most about the relationship with your mother? Baruch Hashem, having my mother, you, can't, you cannot imagine what it is for me to be able to have my mother, to be able to still continue Belia and Hara. She is in health. You see, she is sharp and as incredible as ever. And she is my bedrock. She, I know that, that, that her support of me and her being there. But I, I just want to kind of add to what my mother said and just kind of paint for you a little bit of a picture of the home that my mother and father created for us, which is what inspired all five of us to really go into Chinuch in one way or another. Um, in my home, you know, every guest was welcomed with open arms, with a warm meals, with a bed. Renowned authors, a few that come to mind that I remember, Herman Wook, Elie Wiesel, musician Shlomo Kalbach, every Russian yeshiva, including the front of the Jirav, the Boston Rebbe, the Satmar Rebbe, leading educators from around the world, Again, just to name a few, leaders of every, in every arena of the Jewish community came to our home. But mind you, you know, these were in days where, where, um, where there weren't the kind of kosher stores that there are today. You couldn't just get food and just take out. So I'll get back to that perhaps in a moment. But along with the, the, the great individuals of, of note and fame, every itinerant mishloch passed through our home. You know, every lonely Jew that had no family, no money, no place or means to eat or sleep spent Shabbos in our home. And and what, was that? what did you take out of that? Well, it, I took out of it that the size and the color of the yarmulke is irrelevant. I saw my parents treat every Rosh Yeshiva the same way they treated the Amaharats. I, I never saw my parents speak to a wealthy Gvir in any way that was different than they spoke to the homeless, disheveled Jew. So when you feel and you see and you have a front row seat to that kind of Ahavas Yisrael, where every human being truly means the world to my parents, that, that changes you. It forever, it forever makes you into a different person who, who must 
you know, be able to uh, imbibe and become a person that is an Ohev Yisrael yourself. So let me go to, to the rabbits then. You know, from when you grew up and went to Beis Yaakov till today, I think education has gotten a lot more challenging. I think that um, when you grew up, maybe you, you, you got your news from a newspaper. Life was fairly sheltered, a lot simpler. Today with social media, with iPhones, children at 10 or 11 know more than you knew when you were 25. They're growing up much faster, um, with a lot more competition, a lot more, you know, Instagram. And how would you, as looking back, you know, from yesterday to today, say, give us some of the parents today some advice on dealing with chinuch problems that have really never existed in history before? I can't even do that, and I must tell you why. I speak to teachers who are in the field today, and they tell me what goes on with their, in their classrooms with all these macharikas, with all these, uh, the, 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 all the things they have. The kids can put under their chumash in the Gemara under here. They hide this and they hide that. They all have something going for them, some kind of a, some kind of a uh, something working there. I don't know that. Every time I hear these teachers say, thank you, Hashem, that you made me a teacher at a time when it was so much easier. You had only the child. The only competition you might have had was a comic book. If they stuck it underneath there, you know, if the kid was, didn't want to learn the Gemara, if you had a problem child and he was in, more interested in the comic book he was reading or in the story or the book he was reading, but we didn't have this. We didn't have all these different, uh, all these different uh, mechanical things. Nothing. So, so what advice was, would you give? What advice yeah. would you give the parents today? I can't give them a parent advice. I don't know. I don't know how to advise them because I don't now, live with it. I'll tell you something that the Chanoich was a great grandson of uh, of Adam. Was a grandson. And the question, it's a beautiful name, Chinuch. Yeah. Why didn't Adam name his own son, Chinuch? Why did, he, why did it have to be a grandson? The son, right? And I heard from one of the, uh, from the, uh, one of, one of the, somebody told me, he said, because to be Mechanuch, you had to have experienced it. Adam never had a childhood. Right. How could he educate somebody he couldn't educate a child. He never experienced it. He never went through adolescence. He says his children experienced it. They could name their child Chanoich. And that's what you're sort of saying. So let me go to Mrs. Kanner because you're currently a principal. Today's, today's kids, they're, it's unprecedented in our history, the type of wins. There have been other wins. There have been war and Haskala, But just social media... Um, the sense of competition, like however pretty you are, you go on social media, there's somebody who's better looking, who's better dressed, who's put out a better TikTok. How do you educate today? How do we bring up our children in a time of social media? It's a, it's a packed question with many, many different complex answers. Um, but what I certainly believe is that parents have to have understanding. They must fill their relationship and their home with love, with understanding, with flexibility, and with rules and boundaries. And including social media, I think that parents, unfortunately, um, very often choose to have a good relationship with their kids by becoming their friends and relinquishing their responsibility of, bearing, of being a parent. And I, I think that that is toxic in the relationship. Um, I think that once again, being involved and letting your kids know how you feel, what your values are, and inspiring them to take those values and to implement them into their own lives. But over and over again, as a high school educator, 
I see that what students wish they had were more boundaries and enforced rules because kids see discipline and their parents over their shoulder watching what they do as a manifestation of parental love. They, they yearn for someone to save them from themselves and from the difficult decisions that you've just described. And these rules help them. They help guide them through all their social challenges and they help them navigate the complex world with so many temptations. Um, I think that once again, there is room in that with boundaries set, with expectations set, as long as it infused with love and understanding, clear guidelines and respect for each other, I think, and I've seen it work over and over again. My, my so parents... You're saying, saying shift those so That's right. Spear of the rod. And it doesn't literally mean a physical rod. It means an emotion, uh, you know, the word no is very powerful in Chinuch and you feel that's neglected. Correct. My, my parents were able, you know, again, in a time when we had other influences, we don't have social media, uh, living and growing up, as we described before, in Miami Beach, without religious influences in our life, my parents were able to create a home where there was boundless love, but expectations were clear. Though perhaps I often fell short of the mark, we always knew what was expected, what was right, and most importantly, we were inspired to follow what was right and do what was right, because we too were awed by my parents' dedication and by their integrity, their sincerity, and their, their true belief in their values. And I think when you have models that really live and demonstrate what they preach and those expectations themselves, that transfers and translates to children. I know disappointing my father or mother was our greatest fear. All my father had to do was look at us the wrong way and we were reduced to tears. And to this day, each of us, all of my parents' five children, live to make our parents proud of us. We know what's right, we know what is expected, and we live to fulfill that mission. So Rebetzin, um, you, you speak about almost boundless love. Um, how did you put boundaries? How did you balance boundaries? No, the word no, together with boundless love. How did you balance that? Um, I think I, I was fortunate that I didn't have to say too many no's. Uh, we tried to make, if, if, they, if children, if it was an important thing to our children, and it was something we found difficult, we would find another way to get to it. But there was never a no, uh, never an angry no, and never a forbidding no. Uh, that wasn't necessary. These were bright kids. They understood what, what they had to do and what we, what we expected. And if they asked for anything, we would try to make it very possible for it to be there. We tried very hard not to have to say no because they were good children. And on the other hand, they knew there was such a thing as low sasa. The Torah tells you low. So that was part of it. Rebetzin, what do you value most about your relationship with your daughter? Oh my God, everything, everything. I've, I adore her, I adore her, I adore all my children. They are all so special. I wish you could meet them all. I wish you could meet them all. You would see a very special group of children. But okay. then again, the personal father. And uh, the genes are there. So, Mrs. Kenner, population, a childhood in the United States per, 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 per family, the nuclear family, keeps shrinking. And the millennials ask a question, which to our parents would have been amazing, shocking. And the question we're hearing is, why have children? Right. If somebody were to ask you that, a millennial, how would you respond? Children, oh, firstly, children are our future. Anything that we are is only temporary unless we could take what we have and transfer it to our children. Our children are the future of Klal Yisrael. They are the eternality of the Jewish people, and they will be the carriers and the bearers of the eternality of Torah. That is said so well. 
That was really said very well, perfectly. Well, it's been a, a great honor having two such successful and famous Machan on, and uh, I wish you all best. <laughs> Oh